Hi, I'm Stephen Davis. I'm the head of the Libraries Digital Program here at Columbia, and uh, I have the pleasure of introducing the next group of speakers. Come sit down. You don't have to stand in the wings. Um, we're moving on to now um, two really interesting projects uh, having to do with platform strategies, uh, one for scaling up to bigger and bigger big data, and the other for um, creating um, innovative and effective ways to actually create web archives while also serving other purposes at the same time. So um, we have um, first the wark based project and Jimmy Lin from the University of Maryland, an associate professor there with multiple appointments, at least today. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and Ian Milligan all from the University of Waterloo, is that right? Yes, who um, a late rival. And then uh, after that, we have um, uh, Ji Wu Shir uh, and, uh, and Prashant Chandrasekhar uh, to talk about um, the uninterruptible web service project that they've been working on at uh, Virginia Tech. So um, why don't we go ahead and, and start? All right. All right. Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right, good. I'm a wanderer, so I've always wanted to do this. After I finish, I can just drop the mic, right? OK, um, so uh, let me start off. Uh, can you make sure there's sound? Yeah. Okay, all right. So, uh, and, and indulge me for a few seconds while I sort of preach to the choir and uh, try to uh, tell a poignant story of why you're doing this, uh, why you're doing web archiving. All right, so um, this is an image from the anti-war demonstrations uh, in San Francisco. You can see City Hall in the background in 1967, right? So if you ask a historian, like Ian here, um, when does an event become history? You know, he'll say something like, you know, 20 to 30 years later, right? So this means that the history of the 60s were actually written in around the 80s, right? And so uh, that brings us to present day. Anybody recognize this person? Don't, don't, don't say it, I have a reveal, but uh, <laughs> all right. So this person, okay, what about uh, this image? If you didn't recognize the previous one? Okay, so the, the big fun thing is this. Let's see if this plays. Oh, be so good. Oh, no. Oh, no. Okay, that, that totally did not work. All right. So, I. Yeah, we know what he said. Okay, we know what he said. All right. So, um, so, so that's Monica Lewinsky, right, who had an affair with uh, President Bill Clinton. And he, she recently um, stepped back in the limelight and uh, gave a TED talk about it. And this is what she said. And so, uh, briefly, you know, when the story was broken in uh, 1998, it was the first time the traditional news was usurped by the internet for a major news story, right? And so, the question I want to pose to you guys are, you know, so where are those web pages now, All right? So, um, if an event becomes history and we start exploring it 20 to 30 years later, um, it means we're getting ready to write the history of the 1990s right about now. All right, and so this, this is a very interesting question, right? Can you write a history of the 1990s without the web? All right, and so let me ask you this. Where are those web pages now, right? This is, of course, a rhetorical question, right? We know where those web pages are. Right? You know, Brewster had the, had the foresight a uh, long time ago to say, hey, you know, this web thing is probably going to be big. You know? Somebody should keep a copy of these uh, web pages around, right? which is really visionary. And then it sort of expanded. So I got this uh, from a Wikipedia page about web archiving. There are over uh, 70 plus web archiving efforts around the world. All right. OK, so where are those web pages now? We do have them, right? So the next question is, OK, let's do something with it. Let's get to work. That's do some scholarship, right? And I think this is where we start running into some issues here, right? Um, some of you that heard my talks before uh, have seen this slide before, right? So to be honest, I think we have a sort of a chicken and egg problem, right? Right now, users can't do that much with current web archives. Um, and so on, and on the flip side, it's sort of the egg side, it's hard to develop um, tools for non-existent users. Right, because there are no users, you can develop tools, and you know you can't you can't get around this, right? So I've been advocating, and this is a slide some of you have probably seen before, that what we really need is these deep collaborations between uh, users, archivists, historians, digital humanists, etc., librarians, and tool builders like myself, computer geeks, essentially, right? So we need to develop tools that support exploration and discovery um, in, in web archives, and so what ha what's happened is. Um, uh, and, and going beyond browsing, going beyond searching, right? So what's happened is 
uh, I basically taken my own advice, right? So I met Ian, this is his <laughs> slow, smiling face, about a year ago, and we've been engaged in uh, an increasingly intensive collaboration, essentially him on the user side and me on the tool builder side, right? So well, I'm gonna start here by telling you a little bit about the tool side, and I'll switch over and uh, he'll talk uh, a little bit about the user side, right? So from the technical perspective, the question that we've been asking ourselves is, you know, what would a modern web archiving, what our web archiving platform built on big data infrastructure look like, right? So before we get to that, you have to think about, you know, what are sort of the criteria, what are the desiderata that you need, right? So you gotta store the data, right? You gotta have efficient random access because you wanna pull down records. Um, you wanna have scalable analytics and scalable processing. And then finally, you're gonna have derived data, then you wanna store and access somehow, right? So how are we currently do that, doing this? Right, so um, Internet Archive has a PETA box architecture, um, and uh, most organizations today are still using SANS, network attached storage, so relatively expensive uh, storage solutions. Right. In terms of efficient random access, you have the Open Wayback Machine, uh, but it's sort of showing its age. You know, it's a monolithic, monolithically integrated Tomcat application, and you know, we'd like to move something that's more uh, loosely decoupable and service oriented in, in, in keeping with the architecture of the times, right? Uh, in terms of scalable uh, processing analytics, we're actually doing quite well, um, and our work built on a lot of this. There's been lots of work by the Internet Archive and the Common Crawl about using Hadoop um, uh, for an scalable analytics, and that, that's really a good thing. And then the final, the fourth point, is uh, this derived data. I mean, so far, we've been using uh, ad hoc storage and WAT files, which I think is an ad hoc and temporary solution, and it still has its sort of warts, right? So the way I look at it, you know, the existing tools aren't, ac uh, aren't adequate, and so what do we need? Well, to me, I think the solution is a combination of uh, Hadoop and HBase. And so I'll run through these technologies very quickly, but basically what we want to do is we want to use uh, HDFS, the Hadoop Distributed File System for storage. We want to use uh, Hadoop for the analytics and processing. We want to use uh, HBase for efficient random access and also keeping track of the derived data and providing access to it. Right. So uh, let me run through the technologies very quickly. So at the bottom is HDFS, which is the Hadoop Distributed File System. It's an open source implementation of Google's uh, file system. And the intuition is simple. It takes your data blocks, keeps three copies, and spreads it around your cluster. And this technology is fairly mature by now, scales to hundreds of petabytes. Right. The second is uh, Hadoop MapReduce, which is an open source implementation of uh, Google's MapReduce framework for processing that allows you to distribute computations across hundreds to even thousands of machines on your cluster. And you can access it through high level, higher level scripting languages like PIG. And uh, more recently, there's been talk about a new technology called Spark, which uh, serves as a very nice replacement uh, for, uh, uh, for MapReduce. Okay. And then finally, the, the sort of the third part of the uh, technology piece is uh, Apache HBase, which is uh, an open source implementation of Google's Bigtable. Um, so technically, uh, HBase is a collection of tables, each of which is, represents a sparse distributed persistent multi-dimensional sorted map. Now that's a mouthful. I think Google calling a big table is much more descriptive. It's a big table, has rows and columns, and conceptually, that's really all it is. And it handles a distributed storage and scale up. Okay, all right. So what we've been working on uh, for, for the last uh, year or so is uh, this project called Workbase, which is an open source platform for managing web archives built on Hadoop and HBase. And this is with uh, generous funding from the uh, incentive program and a little additional funding provided by the National Science Foundation. Okay. All right, so let me sort of give you the, uh, the life cycle of uh, how Workbase works. So we assume that you already got collection development, you've done the crawl using, for example, Archive-It. Um, and so you're gonna take your work data and you're gonna adjust it into HBase. And then you're gonna use uh, MapReduce, Pig, Spark, and we have examples of all, all of these for processing and analytics. Uh, text analysis, link analysis. I won't say that much because that's what Ian's gonna actually talk about in a few minutes. And, and then um, the HBase itself serves as a platform for uh, serving your, your applications and providing uh, external facing services. Okay, so oh, you, oh, this image didn't come out. This came from a sort of a promotional photograph we took recently at Maryland. Uh, normally we don't stand around in the data center <laughs> pointing at machines, right? But of course we got Workbase uh, running on our in-house clusters, which is exactly what it was meant for, right? So we got Workbase to run here. 
Now, what's real also interesting is uh, uh, Ian and, and his, uh, his team have gotten Workbase to run here also. Anybody recognize what that is? That's a, that's a Mac Pro. So it's a, basically a desktop machine. And so I call this Workbase in a box. Or more accurately, it's actually a cylinder. <laughs> All right. Um, another interesting thing is, uh, and, and Ian will show you the demo, that it is possible to run Workbase here also on your laptop, right? So you can have portable Workbase, right? So what's the big deal about this? I mean, why do I think this is a game changer? And it's, it's the following. So historians probably cannot afford Hadoop cluster, right? So uh, we have a 25 node Hadoop cluster. It's fairly sizable and chunky, and it was a big chunk of change to, to purchase it, right? But they can probably afford a Mac Pro, a desktop machine, or, uh, or a MacBook, right? And, and so how will this change historical scholarship if we essentially uh, broaden the ability for people to get access to historians and other humanists and social scientists to get access to these technologies, right? So we're envisioning a process like this, right? You're gonna start off with visual graph analysis on the longitudinal data, you select subsets for further examination, and then you drill down and examine individual pages, uh, and then you can go from uh, distant reading to close reading, right? And you can do it all from your desktop or laptop, right? Okay, and then, uh, as a final bonus, uh, we've gotten a work base to run on this. Does anybody recognize what this is? Raspberry. This is a this is a Raspberry Pi, right? So this is a um, we've gotten it to run here, and this is a computer the size of a credit card, and uh, it's about the price of three cocktails here in Manhattan. <laughs> All right. Uh, and so why is this the big why is this a big deal? So. Um, what this allows you to do is store every page that you ever visited in your pocket, right? So think of this as browser bookmarks meets life logging on steroids, right? Throw in a little bit of analytics, like and say, hey, you know, how much time did I waste on Reddit in the last week? Most people probably don't want to know the answer to that question, right? But you can, you can start doing those types of things. Um, so yeah, what will you do now in moving in the future if you can carry a sizable chunk of the web in your pocket on a Raspberry Pi or a future iteration of the Raspberry Pi uh, form factor, right? And how will this change how you interact with the web? I think those are really interesting questions. Okay, so what can you really do with Workbase? Let me put up uh, Ian again and uh, throw the uh, uh, throw the uh, the podium over him. Okay, thank you. And I, I, I promise not really. I'm going to really drop the mic. <laughs> oh, that's all right. Hi, everybody. You already know who I am because you've seen my face. Um, so I'm a historian who's been really, really interested in working with web archives because I think that historians at the, at the very base level are fundamentally unprepared to engage with the quantity of digital sources that are going to transform what we do as historians. The advent of the web, both with born digital sources that can shed so much light on human culture and activity after the advent of web archiving in roughly 96 for our big collections, as well as other traces of the past, presents a profound challenge. Things that, are, had, would never, things that would never have been preserved before are now being preserved, and that gives us unparalleled opportunity. And as Jimmy noted, I don't think you can study the 1990s or beyond if you don't consider the World Wide Web. And that's true for me as a social and cultural historian. That's true for a military historian who's going to get the voices of rank and file soldiers. That's true for a political historian that's going to be able to trace elections, follow the everyday process of policy making, um, and so forth. The web's not a perfect democracy. There's cleavages of ace, um, race, and class, people who access on the web, people who access um, on mobile. But we can't forget that we're still expanding the amount of information being preserved. So no, as Jimmy said, we can't do the 90s if we don't do web archiving. And if we don't start thinking about how to access this now, we're going to get left behind. Because at the end of the level, my own vision as a historian is, of course, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, the Wayback Machine isn't going to be enough for serious historic research. And my nightmare scenario is that if we don't start thinking about critically about tools, we're just going to rely on date-ordered keyword search results, like historians already do with OCR newspapers, stabs in the dark, cherry-picking data, don't understand how their databases work will get left out of post-1996 research, just like historians as a profession kind of got left out of the Culturamics Google Ngram project because we don't like numbers, we don't play well with others. 
and all sorts of things and so i think this is something we actually need to start worrying about now and so luckily i found jimmy he put a picture of me up so i had to put a picture of him up um, and we've been playing around with what we can do with workbase and so the area that i want to talk about today is some of the work we've been doing with unlocking an archive it collection so as people in this room know archive it has amazing collections of social cultural political and economic records generated by everyday people leaders business community, academics, and beyond. There are literally millions of stories of historical interest waiting to be told in those collections. The data is there, but the problem is, how can you actually access it as a historian? And so we use an example data set to sort of you know, prototype out what we can do with Workbase and um, Internet Archive Collections. And we've been primarily working with, over the last few weeks and months, on Archive It Collection 227, which is the Canadian political parties and political interest groups collected by the University of Toronto Libraries. And I want to thank them for, for working us with, that, with us as well. It's a pretty robust longitudinal data set. It starts in October 2005, and it continues to crawl. We can get data as soon as they get it. And it consists of all the major Canadian political parties, of which there's four or five, depending on who's counting, let's say five, um, as well as minor political parties um, and organized political interest groups, such as the Assembly of First Nations, the Coalition to Oppose the Armed Trades, Council of Canadians, etc. the who's who of the Canadian political sphere. One problem has been that it was started in 2005 by a now retired librarian. So trying to find out their rationale for the seed list, the biases within the collection have actually been pretty challenging and sort of skew some of the results we've found. And so the two main approaches that we've been taking that we are going to unify um, are using Workbase for link extraction and analytics, using Workbase for you know, specific full text extraction and analytics, and then also playing around with full text faceted search using the UK Web Archive Shine front end to a, to a solar index. And I want to start by talking about Workbase. So we've been using Workbase to analyze links and full text. We can do basic link statistics, and this is really important when we're actually starting to generate numbers. We can count the number of pages per domain, how many pages are in liberal.ca in 2008. That sort of matters if we're going to normalize things. Count the number of links for each crawl so we can make sense of it all. There's spikes and dirty data all over the place. And all of these things can be run on the command line using relatively simple pig scripts. And so we'd like to come up with sort of a cookbook that historians can adapt and a research team can just change little variables and we'll walk them through it. Uh, Jimmy mentioned pig, although just as I start learning pig, he's going to switch to PySpark, but that's okay. Um, here's a pig script. It's, it's relatively human readable, and, and you can make sense of, of what you're counting. Um, you know, one O'Reilly book, and you're starting to figure out um, what's going on in there. So here, for example, playing with link extraction, we decided let's look at social media appearances. Let's see who were the first people in this collection to use Twitter, for example. And we can see here that outside of Creative Commons, Prime Minister of Canada, um, actually Prime Minister's Office of Canada started using Twitter before the main opposition parties, then the NDP um, and the Liberals and the Green Party got on board. And the actual Conservative Party of Canada didn't come along until a bit later. Uh, Facebook as well, we can see the Liberals started it off, um, the Green Party and um, the sort of slow distribution of people actually hopping onto Facebook politically in 2007 in Canada. By taking the links and turning them into domain, um, aggregating them by domain, we get data like this. So here we're saying, you know, 2008, that's October 2008, conservatives linked to Dig 2,325 times. Um, they linked to Facebook um, the same amount, so clearly it was probably a header, uh, a footer linking to these things. And you just get these massive data, right? They're not that big. The whole thing for about five, six years is only 1.2 megabytes, so it's the kind of thing you can work with easily, put into Gephi super quickly. And here again, we're seeing the Liberals linking a few years later. Um, and so that lets us tell stories. So this is just in Gephi. The contrast doesn't work too well on the screen, but I can kind of explain what's going on. Maybe if Jimmy gives me a bit of clicker. Um, and so we're seeing, yeah, sorry, the contrast sucks. Um, this is saying who is pointing from who and who. This is completely automatically generated by Gephi. And so December 2006, Defend Beyond is elected leader of the Liberal Party of Canada. And if you look at the sort of cluster around liberal.ca, you see that it's overwhelmingly pointed to StefanBeyond.ca. We see the rise of social media. Liberals are pointing at Facebook, Flickr, and YouTube heavily for the first time in December 2007. We're seeing fundraising with the, we're seeing in the anticipation of a federal election, we don't have fixed election if you're in Canada, so this might be significant. We're seeing pointing towards the Victory Fund and the former Liberal, Co -op, the Liberal Party. Uh, we're seeing the announcement of the Green Shift, which was a major policy fight for the Liberal Party of Canada. We're seeing an election campaign, and the Liberals are pointing at this is beyond Harpernomics, Bush Harper, Scandalpedia, the sort of attack ad to characterize our elections. And then after the Liberals lose that election, they're simply pointing to bushharper.ca. 
OK, so, so that's just one example of the kind of stories we can tell. And we can actually use these links to extract corpuses. So I've done this. Like, Let's just take a little thing. Let's read. Let's get that full text. Let's topic model it. And it actually lines up pretty well uh, to what we'd expect to find. And so other things we've been doing with is finding which mainstream media outlets do each political party link to, and how does that change over time? What think tanks have influence on uh, Canadian policy platforms? And how do the political parties relate to each other? So here, for example, we're seeing serendipitously the left or right wing spectrum of Canada. You've learning so much about Canadian politics today. Um, there's the NDP in the left, uh, liberal.ca um, sort of at the top, and then the conservatives at the side. And you can see which, which websites are linked to only from the NDP, the conservatives, the liberals, which ones are shared. And you could also use that to build a collection. And you can tell stories, I like this, the 2005 Canadian federal election. The NDP, which is our left-wing party, didn't actually really attack the Conservatives, the right-wing party. They instead attacked the centrist party, because that's where they're going to steal votes from, essentially, or win votes from. Um, and so we're seeing 2005 overwhelmingly linked structures are, are actually mirroring what we would expect to find. Um, text analysis has also been really useful. Here's another example of one of these pig scripts that we find very useful. And you could provide this to a research team and say, just change line C. In this case, we're running it. We're going to get the full text for greenparty.ca. And it's actually going to be arranged in date. So full text 2008-10-greenparty.txt is going to be the full text for October 2008 for the Green Party of Canada.ca. That lets you do really cool digital humanities um, and other sorts of text analysis. If you do that, you get a circumscribed corpus for liberal.ca, NDP, conservative.ca, and then you can do things like topic modeling or LDA and named entity recognition. And the results there have been interesting. October 2005, we're going back. We see Michael Chong, a fairly obscure Canadian MP now, but who was very, very critical at the time before he left politics. And we go a bit later, and we're seeing the emphasis on Stéphane Dion, even more so in this case on the conservative webpage than the Prime Minister of Canada themselves. They went very, very negative as um, astute observers of the Canadian scene can tell. The trick is visualizing this. It's not the friendliest thing. It's hard to get a research system to go through columns and columns and columns of NER data. And so I'd like to look into some sort of, this is from the Trading Consequences, one of the digging into data platforms, um, sort of a text plot. And you could start seeing your NER things and click on that and go further into context. So that in a really abbreviated session with some of the stuff we've been doing with Workbase, we've also been playing with Shine. And so Shine is developed by the UK Web Archive. It's their front end to interface with their collections. Right now, indexing, we have to get a Hadoop indexer going on because everything's been really quick. Indexing takes a long time. So about 250 gigs of works on that cylinder desktop you saw. It took about five days to index. Um, and so we need to actually make it so that scales up quicker. And this index in total is about 90 gigabytes. So I'm going to switch over to my local browser. I hope it works. It's probably today's not going so well, so we'll see. Um, and just to give you a sense, this is that same collection here from 2005 to 2015. And we're looking at recession um, and depression. And so we can actually see in Canada how political tension starts rising in 2008, starts going very, very high. And you can actually click on these browsers. You can see 100 random samples. We want to make it talk to Workbase because this isn't very useful. 100 random samples from 14,000 websites is going to be um, useless as a historian. But you can click on it, and then you can see the faceted options. And in this case, we see that um, right-wingers, right, more right-wing and centrist websites called the economic crisis in Canada a recession, and the left-wingers called it a depression. Or we can do here an advanced search. I like this. We can look up Harper, who's the last name of our prime minister. We can look at fascist, which is an embarrassing thing many um, opposition people call him. And you do a search. And this, to me, is something that I think already shows the Green Party of Canada, which is a fairly major political party in Canada, in 2008 actually let people, anybody write on their website, which is political stupidity for a mainstream political party. So it's full up. By 2008, it's gone quickly thereafter, because they obviously reconsider. But we're seeing tons and tons that were proximity, Harper within 25 words of the word fascist. And you're already finding scandals and it's, you know, extreme political rhetoric, which would be a great um, paper. And so it's a pretty robust interface. It's not very big. It's pretty easy to serve. And all that code is online from the UK Web Archive. And we've, we've done some walkthroughs and scripts so you could get it working on your own collections um, pretty, pretty quickly. The advantages to it, of course, is that Shine is accessible to the general public. It's easy to use. The interactive trend data lets you dig right into the data. The data comes from the Internet Archive, so you don't have to worry about copyright problems. The disadvantage, keyword searches, you need to know what you're looking for. And random sampling is so misleading when you've got tens of thousands of records, et cetera. And that unlike the earlier examples I showed, it doesn't take advantage of what makes web sources so powerful, which are the hyperlinks. So we need to bring together the hyperlink analysis into these diagrams um, to get a much more sophisticated sense, that we need to build really serious connections between Workbase and Shine. And by doing so, 
you can truly unlock the power of an archive it collection. And so that's a really quick walkthrough. Hopefully you've got some great questions for the two of us. It's been a great year. I feel like I've left out a million things that I could have talked about, um, but I only had 10 minutes, not 45 minutes. So thank you very much for your time. So the, if I understood correctly, the um, on your local machine you were connected to the framework, the cluster in. Okay, so I mean, what what you're doing is pretty awesome. So is there an idea of um, saying building a uh, a suite so that because I know that in Virginia Tech I know some of my uh, me and my colleagues were actually building a lot of uh, machine learning algorithms to uh, uh, analyze archives. So if there's a way to say, develop a standard so that we could add to the library, I think that would be. Yeah, that, that's, hello, yep, that, that, that's exactly the plan. So um, in our experience, we found out that um, working with archive collections yeah. um, has been fairly, uh, fairly convenient. And, it's, uh, and, and so what we're essentially building is a workflow of saying, you know, here's, the, here's your archive collection, do this, do this, do this. Bam, you get your graph visualization, run this pick script, you get your link visualization, run this other pick script, you get your named entity, you know, do this, and then you can import it into Shine and then do full text search. Yes. So it's we're not quite there yet, uh, because we sort of have to um, do it on one collection, take the lessons learned, generalize it, try it on another collection, and so on and so forth. Right. But I, I do want to emphasize here that we need to go back and I go to tell my students all the time that this needs to be driven by the user, right? We need to have somebody uh, that's a user s uh, around and to, to drive it from, you know, what other substantive, uh, scholarly, interesting questions that could be answered from this? And so I, I think that's sort of the key component that I see that's missing from, uh, from some, some of the efforts. I have a question. Um, this, is, this is a question I started already know the answer to, and it's maybe more directed towards Ian, but I think uh, it, it'd be some good added context, um, is sort of what institutional challenges you may have encountered in this project. Um, and I think it's something that, you know, we have dealt with at IA and at Archivit, and that you probably dealt with from the user side, but um, speaking to sort of, I don't know that a lot of institutions are necessarily prepared for the types of research inquiries that are interested in these, this data and these services, researcher policies, user mm -hmm. agreements, how you even get the data to them, uh, methods of delivery. Yeah. So could you speak to some of some of the challenges with getting this data and working with it. I mean, I know how it went. So. Yeah, yeah. So I, I worked with Jefferson. I mean, the, the archive at Research Services Pilot is, is great, and so I was also working a lot with the Watt files. I mean, the downside is you've got archive it. You've got the donor library. I don't know if this is what you're getting at. You've got the donor library at the University of Toronto, and then you've got me, literally 100 kilometers down the road at, at the University of Waterloo. Um, and it took a long time. It, it took. You know, it took like four months really to get everybody online. U of T was, I think, a bit risk adverse, so it was going up probably higher than it necessarily needed to. And it ended up with me driving down and hanging out. It was good, I got some Christmas shopping done. Like hanging out while we copied all the files onto hard drive and then literally drove them back to Waterloo. That being said, when we decided to get all the work files, that went almost, that was seamless. That was just a, once the user agreement was signed, it was checking a box, we could go in, we just w get them all. It was a long weekend downloading and it, and it was fine. So that's a challenge. The other challenge is, of course, computing resources, which is something all of us as humanists face. Um, Jimmy's it's been great working with Jimmy because he gave me a cluster to play around with. Um, yeah, I have toys. Yeah, <laughs> Jimmy, Jimmy has toys, but it was also cool because I, I code, but my code is really crappy and loops and slow and inefficient. And so work-based, when we got it up and running on my local desktop, that was like an aha moment. This is literally something you could go to the Social Sciences Humanity Research Council of Canada or like save up your PR for a few years or something, and you could actually get a computer, and you could run this data set on, you know, I ran Workbase on a terabyte, and it was about 50 minutes to extract all the links on a desktop machine. But that's, that's a kind of efficiency that, that you can't get anywhere else, I don't think. So uh, you've been working with Archive Selective Collections. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I'm not, I'm not sure how the results that have been produced for what proportion of the web is, is archived for general collections apply to Archivet, mm -hmm. but um, uh, how biased do you think these collections are? How much is missing? And how big a problem is this going to be when Jefferson manages to get this kind of thing running on the, the uh, 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 Internet Archive's main collection? Yeah. I mean, the biases are, I've also done some work with the wide web scrape. Um, so the biases are there. The, the data is a lot cleaner, and, and it's more fun to play with in some ways, but the biases are there. Um, in the, Arc the University of Toronto case, it was sort of a rabbit hole. I talked to the current librarian and said, hey, who did this collection? Who made this collection in 2005? And they didn't really know. Um, and then they finally traced it down, retired librarian, you know, reaching out to her and talking to it. And you kind of got the sense in 2005 they sat down, had a really quick conversation about what it had to do. And realistically, it probably has more of a left-wing bias than a right-wing bias. And they were upfront with that. In some cases, that was a contour of 2005. The left was more organized. And then it brings up all sorts of questions like who was maintaining this seed, what decisions were made, all these sorts of things that make those pretty trend charts that would be so attractive, I think, to the general public, make them a bit suspicious when it comes down to human decisions made in 2005 and ad hoc collecting changes made over the following 10 years. And so if we work with it, we have to be very, very clear um, you know, how this collection was, was created. And, and ideally, people will document that when they create their seeds. Because as a historian, if I use that in, in a paper, um, the first peer review comment I get back, I would probably make it myself, would be, how was this data generated? What's the bias in the data? How can I trust the things that you're coming up with? Yeah, but, but all those things apply to archiving questions that come to the, the yes. global place, right? um, Yeah. The one the yeah, no, the, the comparative statistics would be cool. And now that we've got more space, knock on wood, um, I've been doing quite a bit of work with WIDE 0002, which is this 80 terabyte scrape of the web from March to December 2011. And it would be neat to see, even if we just took the CA top level domain, which is about 8 million web pages, which is a, a feasible number to work with, line that up and compare it to the Archivit collections, it would be cool. The downside is with Archivit, because Archivit is, is cool with this, and University of Toronto is really on board. They're, they're having fun with us. They've said, you can put this stuff online, you can have fun with it. As soon as we get into wide web material, I'm pretty sure the Internet Archive might not be happy if we started linking into their collections too deeply. I don't know, maybe Jefferson. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, wait, ha have them say into mic and, yeah. uh, and say it's <laughs> on the record. Yeah. So in the first part of Jimmy's uh, presentation, I was sitting here thinking, wow, I hope to one day have a collection big enough to really need work base. But then it was just a few minutes later and you had it running on a Raspberry Pi. And then I started thinking, wait a minute, these guys are crazy. They've brought, you know, like a wrecking ball to do the weeding in my garden or something, right? You know, the overbuilt the tool for very small gigabyte sized yeah. collections. And so I wonder, uh, what, why do that, right? Why bring those tools to bear on even the small problems? Uh. Okay, uh, so, so I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'll answer this very quickly. Um, I, I think the, the key factor here is the uniform framework allows you to reuse tools from sort of one scale to another, right? So that means the, the tools that you're developing for uh, 10 terabytes will work on uh, 100 gigabytes, and tomorrow, as Moore's Law advances, it'll run on your Raspberry Pi. Right, and so it's the same exact infrastructure that you can scale up, scale down, scale in, scale out, use a cluster, use your local machine, use a Raspberry Pi. So that, that's sort of the, the, uh, the, the, the elegance of engineering argument, I would say. Does that answer your question? Thank you very much. Okay, all right. The title of this presentation, uh, Archiving Transactions Towards Uninterruptible Web Services. Sorry, it's a mouthful, but I hopefully uh, I can decipher the whole thing in the next 20 minutes. Um, so this is a project, a uh, collaborative project between uh, Virginia Tech Libraries and Computer Science Department. Uh, Prashant is a, a PhD student from uh, Computer Science Department, uh, advised by my uh, co-principal uh, um, investigator, Dr. Ed Edward Fox, uh, who unfortunately isn't here today. Um, so this is a project that we're trying to build a little tool uh, to expand web archiving in multiple fronts. Uh, we're trying to uh, break the existing pattern on uh, who's archiving 
uh, how we are archiving and why we are archiving. Uh, so this is an outline. Uh, the, I see this a little project uh, have a very big motivation. I'll explain that a little bit. Uh, and I'll give uh, some technical background uh, of this project. Uh, and I'll show the uh, system architecture and uh, through a very easy, simple and easy demo uh, to give you a better idea on how this works. Uh, in the past couple of weeks, we're uh, working uh, heavily on uh, improving the performance of this tool. Uh, I'll report some results from there. Uh, and also, uh, I want to give you an idea on how we position this project in the wider uh, web infrastructure. So how these small tools uh, can be used uh, by, by running websites. Um, so we're, I want to uh, step back a little bit by looking at uh, who archived the web, uh, what we're archiving, uh, how we archive, and um, why we're archiving. So the first, uh, 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 there are many surveys who's already shown us that the major stakeholders of web archives are uh, cultural heritage organizations, academia. Uh, <coughs> just look around, that's us. Um, uh, I don't mean to criticize, but if you go to other web or internet related uh, uh, meetings and conferences, for example, if you're going to uh, web analytics meetings, or in information retrieval conferences, uh, the audiences and the participants are much more diverse than this one. Uh, so my question is, uh, why aren't industries here? Uh, why there are so few of them, sh should I put it the other way? Um, wouldn't be more participate, help the web archive in a big deal? Uh, I think so, so uh, how we're gonna do this. And then take a look at at uh, what we have archived so far uh, in, in, uh, uh, in the terms of size, I, I believe we have archived lots of things. Um, but many studies have shown that uh, up to now, the web we have archived is far from enough. We probably barely scratched the surface. <coughs> Uh, if you go to the Internet Archive, you can see most of the websites probably have their uh, front page archived several times per year. And anything deeper than that, uh, well, uh, you're out of luck. So is there a way that we can archive the, uh, the web uh, more uh, deeply? Um, and then, uh, the current status of the web archiving is closely related on how we archive it. Um, the survey also shows that the uh, predominant approach that people take to archive the web is the crawler-based archiving, uh, which we set off the web crawler uh, to go out and uh, from the seeds uh, traverse the links and archive what the crawler sees. Uh, we already know for a fact, well, the crawler sees the things might be different from what we see as a people. Um, and, and, and so uh, we don't necessarily got a full picture of, of through the archive. Uh, so there are many other uh, approaches to archive the, wa the web. Uh, why aren't those approaches, uh, well, more widely used? So that's the, the other questions I, I'm trying to uh, solve through this little project. And the fourth aspect I want people to think about is the value proposition. Why we're archiving the web? Uh, so the uh, survey also shows the predominant value proposition is the so-called uh, comprehensive public good. We archive the web to preserve the history, and we collect those uh, data for later research. Those can be useful. Um, but uh, as any uh, comprehensive public goods project uh, indicates, uh, there are many problems of this type of value proposition. We got loads of free writers. Uh, now that Internet Archive is archiving my website, why should I pay my own money doing that? Uh, what is it in it for me, myself? If I'm not an archivist, I'm not a librarian, I'm, I'm not a researcher, what's in it for me to do that? Uh, so th these are the questions I want you guys to think about. Uh, and this is the exactly the same thing we want to, uh, uh, this little project tries to break into. 
So we want to expand the value proposition. We want to ask what the web archiving can do for the potential stakeholders and participants. If you want people to participate, you, you've got to give them something, right? Um, so um, one of the potential participants uh, of web archiving, I think one of the uh, very important ones are the people who operate the website. You have a website, why don't you archive yourself? Uh, so uh, then if we want them to archive, you, you've got to give them a reason. What matters the most to them? Uh, so I have a previous life as a webmaster, and this is something that matters most to me if I'm operating a website. Uh, see that, for 502, that's an error. So website uh, downtime, that's the major issue for any website. Most websites want you to operate 24-7, uh, but that's not always possible. Um, although you put your best effort, things just happen. Um, you got, uh, as a webmaster, you got beeps at midnight telling you, well, your website down, you need to go uh, get up and fix it. So those are my, personally, personally, I think those are my worst nightmare. I don't want to get up at 4, p, uh, 4 a.m. to fix my website, and that's usually can't fix by myself. I need the other people to help me. So uh, those are what matters to web operations. Uh, so what can we do to help them as a web archive? Uh, so this little idea that I think uh, might have quite some uh, uh, potentials. Um, if we have an archive that archives every page, every change of that website, if your website goes down, there's a possibility we can use the archive to fill in those downtimes. Your website's down, and so it hasn't changed, right? So your last updated change, last archive to change is what should be served. So we don't have to go back to this ugly page. Uh, th this sentence is pretty, uh, I don't know what to say. Uh, please try again in 30 seconds, that's all we know. Uh, I tried in 30 seconds in multiple cases to go that and nothing happens. It's still the same 502. So if we have the last update, uh, last archived uh, um, page in an archive, then we can reuse that. Uh, so the, the, uh, the thing is, uh, we can't just use any archive to do this. The archive has to, has to be a, a little bit better than what we have now. Uh, so uh, that's the so-called the transactional archive. A transactional archive sits in between uh, the web server and the user. It archives almost everything. Uh, it archives uh, most 200 results that's getting back to users. So in that sense, uh, uh, a transac uh, transactional archive archives every page a user gets. Um, so, so this project builds on the transactional web archive tool that's uh, built from Los Alamos National Lab. It's called Site Story. Uh, this is an open source tool. Uh, it's on GitHub, so anyone can download it and, and, and take, use, take advantage of it. Um, this is how the uh, Site Story works. So uh, I need the So a user send a, send a request to a server. Uh, the server, if everything works okay, the server will return a response. That's a 200 response, okay. Uh, the site story has two components. One is an Apache uh, um, uh, module. It's called mod site story. The other part is um, Tomcat and Berkeley DB based uh, archive is called Site Story Web Archive. So when there is a 200 response generated, this module will be loaded. This module will grab the same response sent back to the user and send this response, archive that into the archive. And this web archive can be accessed by any users if, if there's permission through Memento protocol. Uh, 
I'm sure we have some uh, familiarity with the Memento protocol. So you send a Memento request, and you will get a, a Memento response telling you uh, this is a snapshot taken at when. So this is how the site story works. Um, so our project, which we called an in, uh, uninterruptible web service, we tries to turn site story into a web infrastructure component that improves the website availability. And we try to mask the web server errors from the end mm -hmm. users. And this will gain precious time for webmasters to recover from application server failure without disrupting the majority of the user's web experience. This is by what we give them back, and hopefully they can help us to, to, uh, to, to help us do our job better as an archivist and a uh, librarian. So, so uh, this is how uh, the, the so-called uh, UWS, uh, Uninterruptible Web Service Architecture, looks like. Uh, this portion, uh, we assume a typical three-level web architecture. So you have a front-end server that's run Apache. You have an application server uh, that deals with the logic, and you have a database sit behind it. So this is the normal web operation looks like. Uh, then we install this part that's the site story thing. And we develop this little thing uh, called mod UWS. This is also an Apache module that sits inside the Apache front, uh, front end server. So we, what this does is, uh, so from this architecture, the solid lines depict how the website works uh, when everything goes okay. So these are the 200 workflows. Uh, this shows how the site story archives a page, typically uh, how it typically archives the page, exactly what I showed in the last slides. So the dotted line shows how things should work when something goes wrong. So we have a request comes in. A request through the front end server usually goes to the application server. Now application server is down. We've got downtime. Now what? If there's a downside here, uh, normally what happens is there should be a 500 errors or five 501 or 502 errors sent back to the application server. If without our body, without our, our body, what would happen is this 500 error will be sent back to the general public, will be sent back to the user, and that's when people see the ugly 500 page. So what we did here is through this little module, we intercept this response that ugly page was not sent back to the user. Instead, we intercept that response and resend that request to the site story archive, which will give us back the last archived page. Then we send this page back to the user. Uh, this sounds very simple. Uh, and hopefully it works. So next I'll show you. <coughs> next I'll show you the, um, uh, a little demonstration. Uh, so a little bit exp uh, explanation. So what this demonstration is about. Um, so I have two. I have two browsers opening. The browser on top shows the visit log of a website that uh, is down randomly. So I inserted random error into the application server. If it works, it will show the current time. If it doesn't, it shows you the ugly five something page. Uh, so this is what a normal website should looks like should look like if uh, without our help. The browser down here uh, is a, uh, this shows the visit to a website that has the same exactly website but has the help of uh, the UWS. So if it works, what should happen is you will never see that ugly 500 page. What you will see is you will, you, you keep refreshing this page, you keep seeing uh, the last updated time. It's the same time that you see last time. So I'm keeping, I keep refreshing the, this one, you see a server error, another server error, another server error, another server error, another one. 
Now you've got the time. You've got another server error. You've got the time. It will just keep going. It's not much interesting thing going on here. So let's see what's going on here. Nothing changed, right? If there, there's nothing changed, it means UWS is working. So throughout this demo, you will see uh, this browser never shows you the server error. There's always some, something coming back. OK, now it's getting boring. All right, so uh, through this little demo, I basically shows uh, the UWS module we build works. Um, but for something that you want to uh, pitch as a web infrastructure <coughs> component, uh, just work isn't enough. It has to be, uh, have fairly good performance. So we've spent uh, the last couple of weeks trying to improve the uh, performance of the UWS module. Uh, first, I would like to, uh, to show you how the workflow of the UWS module works, which I already explained. <coughs> uh, if you see from here, I, t I, take, I take out all the other uh, components. You see from here, you will see the workflow as a long and the winding process. As multiple calls and responses chain together sequentially. Uh, give you an analogy, uh, your drain pipe would be more prone to clog if it's pretty long. Right? The longer it is, it's more prone to clogging. So what we want to do is we don't want a really long process uh, that depends on each other chain sequentially. So we're trying to uh, reduce uh, the, the, the length of the, of the pipe a little bit. Uh, on the other hand, uh, our contribution, the UWS module, sits right in front of the archive. Uh, we don't want the UWS module to be, to be the bottleneck. Uh, which means if you're providing uh, a UPS, an, an, a standby battery, uh, standby uh, service, you don't want the switch to be a limiting factor for your battery. You want the battery to work 100%. So in order to do, to do this, uh, we take a little bit uh, of adventure to look at the current implementation of the side story uh, on the memento request and response. Uh, the current side story implements the most uh, frequently used memento request and response, which is called pattern 1.1, which is typical uh, content uh, a negotiation or a three, 302 kind of uh, response that requires two round trip uh, request and response. Uh, but Memento uh, protocol also allows us to do the pattern for a much simpler request and response without doing the two round trips. So uh, what we did in the past couple of weeks is uh, we extend the uh, side store implementation to add the pattern for implementation. And then we did a uh, performance test. Uh, it's probably too much to explain what all those are. But the, um, uh, the end result is we were able to uh, reduce the UWS load by about one-fourth to one-third. Uh, while we reduced the UWS load, we did not significantly increase the side story archive load. So that's, for us, sounds like a total gain. Um, so now what I want to explain is how do we see the UWS uh, can be positioned in the, in, in the larger uh, web uh, infrastructure, uh, especially how it's re related to uh, the other related components, for example, web cache. Uh, if you uh, understand what I'm saying, you can see how UWS works and SciStory works has quite some similarities, uh, similarities with web cache. Web cache also caches some responses and use the same responses to respond to other requests, right? So what are the relations between the UWS module and the web cache? Uh, the, the differences I can say immediately is a web cache is an is a efficiency tool. It's not a safety tool. Uh, to be a little bit more uh, elaborate, a web cache helps the, helps the web request and response to be faster, 
more efficient, uh, have the same user experience, uh, actually have better user experience. Uh, but the web cache does not necessarily maintain a full, complete copy of the website. This is usually because the cache is more expensive, the size is limited, or the cache uh, is uh, geographically located far away from the, um, from the region server. And the web cache can evict copies as necessary as it sees fit. And therefore, uh, in order to maintain the so-called uh, semantic transparency of the, of the web, which means with or without the cache, the user should see the same results. If we need to maintain the semantic transparency, then the web cache needs to fall back to the region server from time to time, fairly frequently fall back to the region server. Uh, so this is why web cache is a fairly good efficiency tool, but you can't use that uh, to prevent uh, something happening if the region server is going, is going down. That's why uh, there's a major difference between the web cache and, uh, um, and the UWS model we're developing. Um, oops. This is, okay. Uh, so the, un the other uh, comparison between the um, web archive and the backup tool, uh, people always asking, well, many web masters, web masters look at me when we're trying to elicit them to do some web archiving. The first response is, we backup our website all, uh, every day. Why do I need to do a web archive? So why, why do we need to do a web archive? Uh, here's the reason. You, you back up your website every day, you back up the whole database in one file. Trying to respond to one simple error, you need to extract the whole backup and put the whole backup uh, to replace your current uh, website. So the frequency is too low and the uh, granularity of the archive uh, of the backup is too coarse for the purpose of what we're doing here. So these are the how I see the differences, how we position the UWS module as uh, uh, web components. Um, that's pretty much all, what I have to say. Thank you very much, and I can answer questions. For the backup, you said that the frequency is too low. Doesn't that assume that the pages are being visited? Because isn't that when the uh, pages get cached? Sorry, uh, that's about backup. Are you asking about backup or the cache? That's uh, two different things. You, you were saying that the backup. Um, yeah, backup re frequency your is too low. system could serve as a backup. Right. So uh, uh, normal, normally, the uh, website backup their uh, uh, the whole database and application every day. So if there's something happening wrong in the middle of the day, then all you can revert back is a day before. So you can't revert back to what uh, exactly when the error happens. That's why I'm saying the uh, backup frequency is too low for the purpose of uh, using UWS. I know this is a new, a new project. Sorry, it's either too loud or too soft. <laughs> um, but have you started any conversations yet with website owners um, of whether or not they'd be interested in using this? Yeah, the, the, this whole thing started from uh, our conversation with the website owners. Actually, we talk with a uh, uh, university relation in Virginia Tech, which runs the vt.edu website. Uh, their first, I've already described what their first response is, the, which is the driven, driving forces that, uh, uh, that we actually developed this project. Uh, so we are at this moment uh, trying to launch this uh, onto the Virginia Tech College of Engineering and Computer Science uh, department website. After this initial um, rollout, then we'll go back and talk with the university relations about uh, larger uh, uh, deployments. So uh, this is uh, potentially useful for webmasters. I mean, we actually have a similar problem at Stanford, but it doesn't really help archiving because it doesn't get the content out of the custody of the original publisher, which is the essential part of archiving. Leaving it in the custody of the, of the original publisher, it's just another piece of their website, it doesn't help. 
uh, I totally understand what you're saying. Uh, uh, but if we start by asking their content, we're going to be uh, boggled down into uh, who owns the content and how the content can be carried over. So what I see this project is a starting point. As at least we can get them to archive their stuff. And then we're talking about what to do with the archive. <coughs> so I, I had a question. Um, it sounds like the uh, uninterruptibility of this system partly depends on the problem that caused the down in the first place. So for example, I imagine something like a denial of service attack would attack the whole system, and this wouldn't prevent that, if I understood properly. Uh, that's true, actually. Uh, we, I don't see this as a um, silver bullet that can tackle every problem of a website operation. Uh, this particular uh, project tackles the application server errors, uh, which can, caused, can be caused by uh, you launch new code, the new code caused problems, or the, the new code isn't tested for higher load. So these things happens at midnight when something happens to you. So I just wanted to respond to uh, David's uh, comment there. So my team developed a side story just as a tool to you know, capture a website. You know, so not in this kind of context, but just as another capturing uh, paradigm. Um, to come back to your question, uh, there's two things. First of all, the archive can uh, sit remotely. So in our case, the archive of the Memento site and all sit in the Amazon cloud, so not uh, in the Los Alamos environment. And second, uh, integral uh, with the tool is a ARC download possibility, and so you could hand it over and load it up in another archive. So it's really a capture tool. You capture at the source. You can archive elsewhere. And uh, another... No, no, I, I, I think it's a misinterpretation. This is about uh, completely capturing the history of a certain server, which you can never do uh, using web crawling approaches. So it's just another paradigm to capture the stuff. It's every time that the page gets seen, right, so really is published because someone saw it, it also gets archived. So you get a highly granular uh, web archive capture of what your website is doing. And, and that you can offload to another archive if you want. It's like you were using a content management system. Yes, it's the same. Yes. yes. But it's still there. It's not someplace where it's useful to archive. No, that's actually not true. It's I, not I true because it can operate elsewhere and you can hand it over as a work file. Uh, well, th but th that's why you have to distinguish between what GU is doing and what Side Story does. Yes. Okay. <laughs> this sounds like a good conversation for the uh, the after meeting, <laughs> the reception. Thank you, guys, very much. It's very interesting.